Good evening, friends, and welcome to this Good Friday service of darkness. My name is Brian Erickson. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity United Methodist Church, and I'm so grateful that you've joined us for this one of the holiest days of the Christian year. From the very earliest days of the Christian movement, followers of Jesus would gather to tell again the story of Jesus' final days, especially his crucifixion and resurrection. Even before the New Testament was composed, those first disciples remembered these days because they were so important to the story of our salvation. In so many ways, it is only those who learn to stand in the shadow of the cross who will appreciate the light and the joy that shall come on Easter morning. So I'm grateful that you are here. Let us prepare our hearts for a difficult story, a powerful story, the story of God's great love for us, spelled out on the cross. Welcome to worship.
O oh my people, O oh my church, what have I done to you? Or in what way have I offended you? I led you forth from the land of Egypt and delivered you by the waters of baptism, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. I led you through the desert 40 years and fed you with manna. I brought you through times of persecution and of renewal and gave you my body, the bread of heaven, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. I made you branches of my vineyard and gave you the water of salvation. But when I was thirsty, you gave me vinegar and gall and pierced with a spear the side of your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I went before you in a pillar of cloud, but you have led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I brought you to a land of freedom and prosperity, but you have scourged, mocked, and beaten me. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I gave you a royal scepter and bestowed the keys to the kingdom, but you have given me a crown of thorns. I raised you on high with great power, but you have hanged me on the cross. My peace I gave, which the world cannot give, and washed your feet as a servant. But you draw the sword to strike in my name, and seek high places in my kingdom. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I accepted the cup of suffering and death for your sakes, but you scatter and deny and abandon me. I set the spirit of truth to lead you, but you close your hearts to guidance. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I called you to go and bring forth fruit, but you cast lots for my clothing. I pray that you all may be one, but you continue to quarrel and divide. I grafted you into the tree of my chosen people Israel, but you turned on them with persecution and mass murder. I made you joint heirs with them of my covenants, but you made them scapegoats for your own guilt. I came to you as the least of your brothers and sisters. I was hungry, but you gave me no food, thirsty, but you gave me no drink, a stranger, but you did not welcome me, naked, but you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, but you did not visit me. Others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews.
One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise.
Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him.
After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, 
including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Stand at my grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I am the softly falling snow. I am. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit.
All four Gospels tell the story of Jesus' crucifixion. They all add to the picture of what we see on Good Friday. Jesus' torment, his mockery by the soldiers, the religious leaders, the crowd. We see his suffering, the darkness of the night sky, even though it is the middle of the afternoon. On my mind tonight is one of the details that only the Gospel of Luke gives us. And it's from several hours before Jesus is actually crucified. But the events that will lead to his death have already been set in motion. This moment comes after his last supper with the disciples, a supper in which he not only sets the stage for his sacrifice with the broken bread, the blood red wine, but he also announces to his disciples that they would all fall away, that they would all fail him in his hour of need. Even when Peter admitted that the rest of the disciples might turn their back on him, but he never would. Jesus tells Peter that he indeed will fail and fall, that he will deny even knowing Jesus before the cock crows three times, but that afterwards, Peter must remain strong. Jesus says to his chief disciple, Simon, Simon, listen, Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your own faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned back, might strengthen the faith of your brothers. Peter hears it like a challenge, like most of us would, that that he must rise up in this moment, that he must show his strength, show his faith. And so when when they come to arrest Jesus in the garden, Peter alone swings a sword at one of the high priest's slaves, a futile attempt to protect his master. But he is, after all, a fisherman, not a fighter. And Jesus bends down to heal the man's ear before he is bound and led away. That the moment I would draw our attention to tonight is after Jesus has been led by torchlight to the house of the high priest, where a hastily gathered group of leaders will pretend to give Jesus a fair trial. And there, in the darkness of night, outside Caiaphas's house, in the courtyard, there is a group of bystanders warming themselves by the fire. Among them is Peter the chief of disciples, the one who swore faithfulness, the one who swore to stand alone among the steadfast. And sure enough, the other disciples are nowhere to be found. But there is Peter, as close as he can be to his teacher and his master and his friend. But then in the light of that fire, Peter's recognized, first by a slave girl. This man also was with him, she says. But Peter denies it. In fact, he doesn't just deny being with Jesus. He declares, woman, I I don't even know him. A little later, someone else on seeing Peter said, you also are are one of them. But but Peter said, man, I am am not. And even an hour later, still another kept insisting, surely, surely this man was also with him for for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I, I do not know what you are talking about and you don't know what you are talking about. And at that very moment, while Peter was still speaking, the cock crowed, Luke tells us. In the other Gospels, it is the sound of the rooster's crowing that wakens Peter to his denial, that that makes him see what he has done, what he has become. But here is the detail that only Luke includes. It's a short verse, a sentence long, but it says everything. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Evidently, even with Peter out in the courtyard, they could see one another, Jesus and his friend. And in the very moment that Peter failed, in the very moment that Jesus' prediction came true, Jesus turned and looked at his friend. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. And this look changes Peter forever. Because you see, this is the last time that Peter will see his master before his death. The last time he will see him alive. And it is at the moment of his failing, the the moment of his cowardice, that the moment of his declaring, I don't even know this man, you don't know what you're talking about. That the Lord turns and looks at Peter. It is the last time that Peter will see Jesus. And so later, the next morning, when Peter hears that his master has been brought before Pilate, that his master has been flogged within an inch of his life, Peter sees that same face staring back at him. 
It's the last time Peter will see Jesus. And so what when he hears that Jesus has been sentenced to be crucified, that, that he is carrying his cross through the streets of Jerusalem. You know, and meanwhile, Peter and the others are hiding out of fear, out of uncertainty. Peter cannot hide from his face the one he saw in the courtyard. He sees it over and over and over again. It is the last time Peter will see Jesus. And so when he hears that Jesus has died after hours of hanging on the cross, the iron having pierced his flesh and fluid having filled up his lungs, when Peter hears that they have hurriedly taken down his broken, lifeless body and laid it in a new tomb, Peter sees that same face. We only know that Jesus looked at Peter because later in his life, Peter must have told the story. In fact, I imagine for the rest of his life, Peter saw that face. Luke does not tell us what kind of look that Jesus gave Peter, though, that night in the courtyard. He leaves that to each of us to decide. It could easily be it have been a look of judgment. Peter has talked a big game, but now in the very hour that Jesus needs him most, he pretends to not even know who he is. It is easy to imagine, it's easy to justify Jesus looking at Peter in judgment. Perhaps it is a look of disappointment. We all know how that feels because Jesus could easily have been disappointed. What, what could a slave girl do to Peter Peter was not standing before the high court, not standing before the high priest or the Sanhedrin. He was standing in a courtyard, and even there he could not admit that he belonged to Jesus. Surely Jesus must have been disappointed in Peter. And it could easily have been a look of heartbreak, as this is the moment in which Jesus knows just how alone he is, that even his most ardent disciple has abandoned him completely. As Jesus is led from the high priest's house, he knows fully what he has always known in part, that he walks this road alone. And so he looks at Peter in heartbreak. But my guess is that it was none of these. Not judgment, not heartbreak, not disappointment. And the clue to me is that Peter runs away from that last look, weeping bitterly. My guess is that Jesus looks at Peter one last time and there is not judgment There's not disappointment. There's not heartbreak. There is only love. Love for his disciple and his friend. And it is that look of love that is too much for Peter to handle. Because Peter knows, especially in that moment, that he deserves at least the one who pretended he could be enough. The one who pretended that he could rise to the moment, that he could do something to help. The one who thought that he could remain faithful when everybody else fell away. He saw his master one last time, knowing that he was helpless to save his friend or himself. And Jesus' eyes were still filled, even in that moment, even for him, filled with love. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Tonight we've come to the cross to behold what we would rather not see. It's the cost of our sin, the foolishness of all our attempts to save ourselves, that the cruelty of our species on full display stretched out on that wooden beam. But we are not just onlookers tonight like the rest. We are not the callous crowds or the religious hypocrites or even the thieves hanging at Jesus' side. We have not just come to see him. We have come to be seen by him. For here, hanging on the cross, he turns to look at each and every one of us. He looks upon those that deserve judgment, those who have fallen short, those who have done their best to measure up, and those who have given up on trying. He looks on us, and we are the ones who have broken his heart. We are the ones who have betrayed, who have denied, who have turned away. We are the ones who deserve condemnation, but there is no anger in his eyes. There is no revenge. There is no cruelty. There's only love. Love for those who could never return such a love. For the one condemned by the high priest is the true high priest. And here on this altar of a cross, he presents himself as the sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Tonight they do not take his life from him, He gives it away. And despite the betrayal, despite 
is suffering despite humanity throwing its very worst at him. He looks on us still and his eyes are full of love. Tonight, somewhere on the other side of town, Peter weeps bitterly, those eyes burned into his memory, knowing that he has looked at his Lord and master and friend for the last time. But Peter is wrong. 